Thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, last year in this uh, in this conference also to present a talk about uh, a service that we developed in Telefonica. This year is not about uh, something that we have developed, but about the lessons that we have learned uh, in investigating microservices and how to improve our skills in, micro in microservices to to deliver our uh, services in production. So it's very nice to see a lot of uh, young gophers uh, with a lot of energy. Um, energy is very required in this profession because uh, we have to learn a lot uh, every day. Uh, the things are changing very fast and continuous learning is very important. So my presentation is about uh, the patterns, the architectural patterns that we uh, we should follow in order to deliver uh, applications where basic based on microservices in production uh, and remember the patterns are approved solutions to uh, common problems so some people have already uh, worked in all these topics and we should take benefit of their experience so uh, uh, when we start a project, uh, we basically we have a, we can take decisions and probably we have the best intentions. And at the end, uh, we have the, the same impression that we could have done things better. But this is not. Uh, I don't know how many people uh, have feeling have felt uh, this, the same thing. I, I felt several times. So uh, this is not bad. Uh, th this just means that you know better the domain pro of your problem, that you have learned a lot during the development and you know how to do things better. Uh, the problem is when you think that uh, what you have done is the best thing in the world, but it's not. So this is not really bad. So let's start with a brief introduction to microservices. I will go very fast because we don't have time. But uh, it's based on divide and conquer principle. Uh, we have a very big uh, problem to solve in our mm, in our uh, company, and we can divide this problem in uh, small services, where each service has uh, some small functionality. Uh, based on the single responsibility principle, each microservice will have uh, a small functionality of all the functionality that the application has to do. And the problem is how we can find, uh, how can design, how, how can we design the boundaries of this microservice? So this is the difficult thing that we have to implement as software developers or as, as software architects. But the problem with uh, microservices is we can divide uh, the problem into small pieces of the problem, but uh, we are uh, building a distributed system and distributed system have a lot of inherited problems like the network is not reliable we, we introduce la latency and we introduce a lot of problems that we can uh, understand perfectly in order to avoid a disaster in production so this is uh, a sentence from uh, one of the uh, the developer of go kit and this, I, I think that is really true. Uh, with microservices, we solve organizational problems because we, when we have a very big organization, uh, the typical thing is that uh, it's, uh, each team produces one or several microservices, but uh, then we cause the technical problems because it's more difficult to, to monitor all this myriad of uh, microservices instead of uh, a monolith application. Um, we have to take into consideration that uh, we, the microservices are not for every project. So if you have a project with a team of only three people, uh, I don't think that microservices will be uh, any benefit for you. So we have, uh, by principle, monolith is not bad. In some cases it's good and in some cases we can take a different approach. Well, when we are here Gophers developers and there are a lot of uh, ways to develop our microservices. In Go, we have a lot of advantages because Go is a very good language program, uh, a very good programming language 
uh, to develop network applications and also the footprint of these uh, services is going to be very small. Imagine to develop a, a microservice in Java that you require two gigabytes of memory in order to, to run the microservice. So instead of microservice, it's a gigabyte service. So uh, there, are, there are several ways to develop our microservices. First, in HTTP, this is a well-known uh, problem. Every, every, everyone knows how to do that. Of course, there are uh, web frameworks or you can use uh, Gorilla MOOCs for, for that. There are a lot of ways to do that. The second approach is to use a gRPC service. And gRPC service, uh, I will focus a bit more in that because it's not uh, so uh, common for, for developers. But basically, uh, you have a, a, a defined interface in protocol buffers, a protofile where you define the service and the messages, the format of your messages. This is the, the first step. When you have uh, defined your interface, um, it's like a standard that you have to constrain to this, to this file that is not available, for example, uh, in REST API that is completely open. You can use Swagger or this type of specifications, but it's, uh, it's more open. Then you can compile uh, with the gRPC plugin, and the gRPC plugin will generate the stuff and skeleton for building for building servers and clients of this uh, gRPC service. So you don't have to worry about all this boilerplate of uh, building a server or a client. What you have to do is, based on the interface that it, uh, the, the, this compilation produces, you have to implement the, the server interface. And finally, you have to, to uh, start the server, uh, adding this, uh, this handler so that uh, you expose in, in a connection the, the server. It's pretty simple. And the good benefit of that is the high performance that gRPC services uh, are providing because you are using uh, protocol buffers that uh, it defines a binary serialization. You don't have to worry about JSON or all this stuff. You are working with types. Um, and also you are using a transport that is HTTP2. So uh, you can multiplex uh, several requests and responses in a very efficient way in the same connection. You don't have to open uh, millions of connections. So we have seen uh, two ways of, of building microservices in Go, uh, and the other way is to use uh, event-driven micro microservices. So uh, you can use any type of queue, like Revit in queue, like uh, uh, NATS, uh, Kafka, whatever you consider as a message-oriented middleware. Um, Sometimes we are only focused on developing uh, microservices with require response patterns, but it's very important to, to understand our domain of the problem. And sometimes uh, an asynchronous approach uh, based on messages, uh, a change of messages is much uh, more efficient and much more valid than a request response. For example, imagine a case where uh, you want to uh, notify several consumers, uh, so several clients, that, uh, in order to make different tasks. So uh, to do this with uh, micro with require response, you would have to to invoke uh, three different uh, servers, and in this way, you can just put a message in a queue, and uh, this message-oriented middleware will notify to these consumers. So there are a lot of patterns uh, in order to build these event-driven microservices, these, these publishers and these subscribers that we are not going to focus. I just want to, to comment one of these design patterns that is event sourcing. Event sourcing is basically that uh, whenever you change your database, uh, instead of uh, creating a transaction in your database to modify, for example, in with using SQL or whatever, uh, 
the, the database, you just create an audit log. You, uh, you are uh, storing in a queue event logs, and these event logs are, are, uh, are an audit log, a series of, of changes, but you don't modify really the database. So combined with with CQRS, that is common uh, common query uh, segregation responsibility, uh, this is other pattern that you can uh, send uh, you can divide what is the common that modified your database from what is the query. So in this case, for example, that is this diagram, uh, we can send these uh, these changes in the database, these command requests via the event bus, that are messages, so that uh, whenever there's a query in this part, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can query to, the, uh, to a real database and it will be very fast, because this event handler is updating the database like uh, it was a, ca a cache. So this is somehow to, to implement a, a way to transactionality it's not transactional because uh, working with transactionality in microservices is really hard. But sometimes you, we need something that is very uh, robust and trustable, and this is one pattern that we could uh, use. The ideal world is that we don't have to, to worry about that, and if it's the case that we don't have to be concerned with this uh, high-level patterns, it's much better for, for our life. Well, um, then we, we need to work with, with microservices patterns. Uh, it's what I commented before, that uh, a lot of people have worked with microservices before, and the common problems have been solved with, with these microservices patterns. Let's see some of them. The first one is service discovery. When we, when we launch these services or microservices, uh, each microservices register in a service registry, each instance of the, of the microservice. And there's a load balancer that the client can use in order to uh, send a request to one of these instances. Uh, it uses the service registry, for example, asking for, give me, all the, give me one of the instances for this type of service and the load balancer will send the request to that uh, instance. And there are two possibilities. You can put the load balancer at the server side. It's the typical world that uh, you have like a proxy that, or a virtual IP that you can uh, send the request to one of the instances. But you can also put the load balancer in the request side, in, in the client side. And in this way, we can do some things very, um, very interesting, like circuit breaker. The circuit break breaker pattern is, uh, is used when there are problems in the, in the network, in some of the services. And this is something that will happen in, some, in the short term or in the mid term. Problems are there and it happens. So imagine that you have a chain of microservices and the last service is overloaded or is down. So if you are sending the request in the same path, at the end there will be some timeout or uh, that will uh, uh, generate a response after this timeout, uh, and the service will be the, uh, will be degraded a lot. So what w uh, circuit breaker detects where are the problems and try to find a alternative path, or at least to reply as soon as, as, soon as possible that there, mm, there is a problem. So combined with a retry or with uh, 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 switching to a different path, either, for example, searching uh, an alternative service or an alternative error condition, you will have a more robust uh, application based on microservices because it's uh, it's very important, for example, that when a, a service is degraded, you don't overload it even more because it uh, it will degrade it even more. So, 
Another pattern is uh, the, API, the API gateway. For example, uh, you can expose all these APIs that you are um, building in your microservice infrastructure to the outer world so that they, they can use uh, directly, for example, a, a portal or, uh, or a client based on an APIs. Um, this API gateway can provide security to authentication, authorization, also monitoring, load balancing, a lot of well-known patterns that will uh, understand the problem and how uh, all these things are working. And another point in when we have a lot of microservices is uh, monitoring, observability of all our uh, microservices. And for example, distributed tracing is uh, very interesting. Where we can see for, uh, for each request w w that we uh, send, all the microservices where uh, it's passing the, the request from uh, in all this composition of microservices um the the latency that is introduced in its microservice so we can find uh, what uh, steps are given more latency what uh, what the steps we have to consider that uh, are generating problems and in order to improve or to detect problems in our architecture so uh, these are basically there are a lot of uh, other design patterns that uh, we are not going to enter in them. Uh, we are going to focus on several solutions that uh, we can build uh, for our microservices. The first one is uh, GoMicro. GoMicro is an, a framework, a complete framework, that is an open framework. Uh, so uh, it, it has taken some decisions, that clever decisions, but uh, but it could be a difficult uh, if you have a very customizable solution or you, you have or you require a lot of flexibility. It has a low barrier to entry, so you, it's easy to, to use and it covers most of the, of the patterns that uh, you decide, uh, you require. Um, there are several layers in this micro, uh, basically the, the core is the uh, Go Micro, but you can, uh, in the Go Micro, you work with gRPC microservices. And on top of that, uh, you have a sidecar that is uh, uh, an HTTP proxy so that you can uh, expose the gRPC service that exposes Go Micro uh, as an HTTP uh, server. You also have an API gateway, uh, a web and a CLI to, to manage all the Go Micro framework and, and also a bot. But uh, if we focus on Go Micro, basically what you have is uh, a, a client and a server. You start with a, a, a definition in a protocol buffer interface. And with this definition, you will generate the server and the client. You, of course, with, uh, with gRPC, then you have to implement the server as always. But what uh, Go Micro provides is uh, a selector and a registry. So automatically, it includes the service discovery approach with different with with console, with ECD, with also um, Kubernetes if you use Kubernetes. So these servers automatically register in the, in the service registry. And the selector will use uh, will be used by the client in order to do this client side uh, this uh, discovery this client side load balancer. So the selector is uh, who takes the decision of which instance of a specific service type is going to invoke. And there are several policies to select one of these instances. And then there is the transport. The, uh, it supports several transports: HTTP, gRPC, TCP. And it supports also uh, request response, but also uh, streams. So if you require a stream pattern, it's, it's also available with a circuit breaker and also a rate limit policy. So we can establish a policy that you, uh, we want only for this client or for this server, uh, we only want 1000 TPS or whatever. 
and it also supports uh, a broker so for event oriented um, services this is the good a good approach to publish and to subscribe to to messages this is the sidecar i don't want but basically is the sidecar uh, pattern that you can attach to a uh, one of these gRPC server and as as a client, it exposes a server, a HTTP server, and as a client, it invokes this gRPC server. To implement a Go Micro server, as I've said, the first step is to define the gRPC server. We define the, the gRPC service with all the methods. Uh, I don't know if you can see, I expect so because the letter is small, but basically you you define the service with the methods. In this case, we only have a, a, a single method and the format of these messages. This is a very stupid uh, service, but just to, to represent what we can do. With this specification, we can compile with protocol buffers. We can compile uh, and in order to generate the server stuff on a skeleton in order to implement our ser uh, servers and our clients in a very simple way. And we have to focus on this plugin that we add uh, to the protocol buffers. Uh, so this is one of the main drawbacks of Go Micro that it generates all this stuff specific to Go Micro. So uh, one of the advantages of Go of gRPC is that it's available for multiple languages, not only for Go, it's available for Python, Java, for all the languages. You can create a server uh, for, you can create a server for one language uh, and the client for other language. But in this case, we are uh, constrained to Go. Uh, we can develop uh, the we can implement the, the interface and finally start the server. This is very similar to gRPC. Then we have GoKit, and uh, we have very few time. So in GoKit, I'm not going to enter enter into that because we don't have time. But basically, uh, uh, this is, this is ha you you have to generate a lot of boilerplate. Uh, it, it is based on clean architecture and interfaces, the dec decorator pattern, but you have to develop all, all the stuff. You, you only have uh, utilities, uh, functions to, to use all these patterns, to have circuit breakers, service discovery, and all, this, all these things. But uh, uh, we don't have, uh, you have to implement it. And the other thing is gRPC. With gRPC, we have, uh, in the last years, uh, we, uh, it was introduced interceptors that is middleware that we can attach to clients and servers. And we, can, we have two different types for owner interceptors, that is the typical request uh, response, but also for streams. And this is the way that we develop uh, a specific interceptor. Um, there's a project that we can uh, that uh, provides a lot of these interceptors for authentication, login, metrics, tracing, retry, rate limiting, and validation. So uh, we have a, a demo for this. This is uh, a project that basically what uh, we have is this project that we have built an API with three microservices. So uh, I cannot enter into that, very, but the Docker Compose. We have a Docker Compose with these three microservices with the API that is based on gRPC uh, API Gateway. So we don't have to implement it. It's just to introduce some functional, some functionality, some configuration in the protocol buffer. And we have integration with Prometheus and Thipkin. So uh, if we go to, for example, one of our servers, 
we have uh, introduced uh, open tracing here. Uh, and we could launch it. Well. <laughs> So basically, we could uh, we could uh, send uh, well we could send uh, requests uh, via our API, <coughs> and here. I'm not sure what is happening. <laughs> well, this is the uh, this is probably the demo effects. But using uh, we, we, using middle words, uh, sorry because I don't have uh, enough time. Using middle words, we could have uh, adding Prometheus as a as a metrics uh, and also uh, a Thipkin as for for tracing. And just to to end, uh, we have uh, an, a new concept that is service mess. The service mess is based on ambassador pattern, where we have uh, the ambassador pattern is basically to introduce to add a proxy attached to our microservice. So instead of adding all these patterns that we have seen in the in the code of our microservice, we use this proxy. Uh, to implement all this all this stuff and it's responsible for the retries for the circuit breaking for metrics and all these observability issues and finally uh, one of the most well-known service mess this is something that they started one or two years ago is Istio. Istio uh, have two layers the data layer that is what we have seen the ambassador pattern where the proxy is implemented with envoy this is the responsible of all the of all the of all these uh, and non-functional things. So we only focus to implement our microservices with the with the functional with the business logic that is required. And this envoy proxy uh, communicates to the other uh, microservices of our platform. And we have also a control layer that is responsible via APIs to configure these these proxies. So here it is the resources. If you are interested in the in the demo, the demo works, but uh, I couldn't uh, uh, for sure. <laughs> so uh, it's just to uh, you, you have a readme to to know how to launch it. It's based on gRPC, and I'm open to any question if if you want. Did you look into dropping databases and using Kafka as the persistence layer totally? So not just for messages, but also having all data in the bus. So it could be with this and sourcing. It, it is based on that. Uh, in Kafka, you could have this audit log. It would be a possibility, but we haven't tested that. I think it's... Uh, it's not uh, what we ha we are currently doing in our in our projects. What we all, what we have uh, um, and we use very frequently is that any the command and query separation concerns. So we update our database, 
but uh, the the query uh, we have like a cache for our queries and we update via um, via messages uh, we we send messages to our other other consumers of our architecture so they can take decisions uh, asynchronously this is something that we do but uh, we haven't implemented a database with kafka it's something that are you doing in currently? Or? Yeah, in production. Okay, yeah, and it works okay. okay. It's very good. Eight million messages in, I don't know, 20 seconds or something. And then you have it in memory. But maybe there's a downside, so I wanted to ask before it happens on prod. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions. Uh, okay. But I'm sure you can... Um, try to stop Jorge while you find him in the conference and ask him the question directly. Thank you very much. Thank you.